Welcome back students. Uh, this is chapter 16 on cell signaling. The first section deals with general principles about signaling and then the remaining two sections go into examples that students should be aware of. One of the questions students ask is how many of these systems do they need to learn? Uh, the good news is that most of them piggyback on each other. That means they use the same basic pathway except that they do slightly different things. And once you learn the basics, uh, the specifics are pretty simple to understand. Here is a very short list of learning objectives that students must know in order to do well on the content of this chapter. A larger list has been published under other means. Before we dive in, here's some uh, terminology that will be useful in understanding many of the comments that we're going to be making on this video. A ligand is any substance which binds to proteins, and that's important to understand. So some of these signal molecules will be ligands. A receptor is always a protein structure present either on the surface of the cell or within the cell to which its ligand will bind. Kinases are protein enzymes, enzymes which add phosphate groups to their target molecules. And phosphatases do the opposite. These are protein enzymes which remove phosphate groups from those same target molecules. Also, we'd like to share with you some information that's still outstanding. Uh, it's common knowledge now that humans have about 21,000 genes. There's still no agreement on the actual number. But most of these genes are coding for proteins. Not all of them, because some of them code for RNAs. But most of these 21,000 genes code for proteins. So if that's the case, uh, we should be able to produce about 19 to 20,000 different proteins. And that's not the case, because we can produce over 100,000 proteins. How is that possible? Well, with alternative splicing, where different exons are mixed together to produce new and novel proteins in different cells. But even then, even then, with alternative splicing, we still don't have enough proteins to account for all the variation that we see. So there's other stuff going on inside cells that we still don't understand. And that's the important thing about this chapter. It relays our understanding at this time, which is pretty good, but still not complete. Overall, the meaning of this chapter can be better understood by first understanding that all cells, regardless of whether they're inside a multicellular creature or living individually, respond to their environment. So what in the environment makes the cell respond? It could be anything. It could be food molecules. It could be waste products. It could be danger signals. It could be toxins. It could be anything. So regardless of whether you are a multicellular creature or you are a single-celled creature, you will have on your surface or inside your cells receptors and those receptors will receive signals in the form of many different types of substances and once those signals are received they will change the behavior of that cell. That's the essence of this entire chapter. So here we have an example of yeast cells before a signal and then after the application of the signal. In this case the signal is a protein and that protein is a mating factor which entices these cells to grow towards target cells where they can then perform sexual reproduction. Regardless, the signals are the important thing that gets everything going. And these signals can exist in many different forms, but the important thing is that they are mostly, in the case of cells, proteins, or even smaller than proteins, peptides, or even smaller than peptides, there are certain individual amino acids or modified amino acids. They can also be modified nucleotides. They can be steroids. They can be fatty acid derivatives. And even dissolved gases can have an impact on cells. And we'll see examples of all these in the subsequent slides which follow. In science, when signals are converted from one form to another, or when messages are converted from one form to another, or when energy is converted from one form to another, we use the term signal transduction. So signal transduction simply means transducing something, converting it from one form to another. 
So the example they use is a cell phone where the signal comes in and sound comes out. So something has been converted from radio waves into vibrations in the air. A similar analogy works with cells where the signal comes in and then it interacts with the cell causing the cell to do something. So signal transduction is the general term applicable to this entire chapter. Physiologists like to refer to different signal molecules produced in different parts by various names. So the one that you're famous with is the endocrine system. So the endocrine system produces long lasting long distance molecules which travel all over your body and are pretty stable. So those are called endocrine. The next category is paracrine. Paracrine are signal molecules that don't travel too far before they decay and or are eliminated. And that's paracrine, so local cells, maybe within the same tissue. Then we have more specific interactions, so synapses, where the chemical is released and it's only lasting long enough to get across a synapse before it's either destroyed or decays. And then finally, an extreme version of this is contact dependent, where the signal is not released by a cell producing it, but instead carried on the surface and it makes contact with the receptor directly. So only that cell will be then communicated to. There is one other terminology that is used in physiology books and that's autocrine. So if you think about it, auto means self, crine means molecule. So these are molecules released by the cell to impact its own receptors. So keep an eye on that please. This figure taken from the textbook tries to convey the contact dependent signaling mechanism that we saw right here in panel D. So during development, in this case in a fly, um, many cells of the same type, epithelial cells, are produced in a location. But one of these cells, the center cell here in this case, is then given information signals to become specialized. And as that cell becomes specialized, it wants to make sure that its neighbors don't follow down the same pathway because there's not going to be enough room for these cells to pass through the tissues of the fly. So on the surface of the developing neural cells, we produce these ligands, these red molecules. And the red molecules are called delta in the fly and they have receptors on the contact dependent cells around, as you can see, these six cells. And these receptors in green will then convey information into these epithelial cells to prevent them from developing into neurons. Both the red molecules and the green molecules are proteins, and because they're embedded in the membrane of both types of cell, they're called transmembrane proteins, something that we learned in the past. It's always nice to have knowledge of some of the types of signal molecules that we're talking about. So this table here and the one that follows on the next slide are giving you some of the names of these substances. So if you go back to panel A, those are endocrine signals, those are hormones and adrenaline or epinephrine as it's called now is the substance that's released and travels all over the body as is insulin and testosterone and thyroid hormone. So there's a whole bunch here, cortisol included. But that's not the only type. So examples of local mediators, these are the substances that are paracrine, as indicated here, would be epidermal growth factor, EGF, uh, platelet-derived growth factor, PDGF, etc., etc. The next category will be synaptic molecules, and examples of them are given here as acetylcholine and GABA. And then finally, uh, the last class, which we already spoke about in the case of the Drosophila, uh, they will be the examples of Delta. So these are enough for you to understand. Another general concept is that not every cell has a receptor of a particular type. So only those cells which have the appropriate receptors will respond. Now it's important to realize also that the same signal molecule can have different impact on different target cells, as indicated in this slide. Acetylcholine is the signal molecule and it has 
impact on many different tissues in the body, but the authors have only selected three. So we have heart pacemaker cells, we have salivary glands, and we have skeletal muscle. So the same molecule travels around the body and it has these receptors. You can see the receptors are different types, but they all bind the same ligand, acetylcholine. Binding to pacemaker cells slows down heartbeat. Binding to salivary glands induces the secretion of saliva. And binding to skeletal muscle causes muscle contraction. Cells have been programmed by nature evolution to continuously be stimulated by signals from the environment. The signals can be classified into many different categories. Some are called survival signals, which allow the cell to continue to do its normal job. Others are mitotic factors, which encourage cells to divide. Others are differentiation factors, which cause cells to change behavior, either by expressing different chemistry or changing its gene activation, expression patterns. And indeed, if cells are deprived of these signals, in most cases, especially multicellular creatures like animals, then the lack of signals initiate programs within the cell that eventually kill the cell from within, a process called apoptosis, which we discussed previously. So in a multicellular creature like you, you have all kinds of signals floating around, telling different cells different instructions. Just like in the human body, we have two mechanisms of communicating from one place to another. We have the fast nervous system, and then we have the slower endocrine system. So similarly, uh, cells also have two mechanisms that rush through their cytosols. One mechanism is fast. That can do changes, biochemical changes, very quickly. And the other mechanism is slightly slower because it has to activate genes and activation of genes and the processing of the relevant messenger RNA and possibly proteins before action is taken is a slower mechanism. So just remember, even though these two mechanisms can overlap, uh, one is considered the fast mechanism and the other methodology is considered the slow mechanism. Just as there are two mechanisms of speed of response, there are also two mechanisms of place of interception of the signal. So the first place that signals can be intercepted is on the surface of the plasma membrane. And in these cases, the signal molecules are unable to pass through the lipid bilayer because they are either too large or they have a charge. For these, there's an external extracellular receptor, which is normally a transmembrane protein, as we'll see later on. But the binding to the extracellular surface causes a knock-on effect, which changes the structure of that same protein on the inside in some way. And that signal is then relayed to the machinery in the cytosol and into the nucleus of that cell. And the second mechanism is where the receptors are either in the cytosol or they're in the nucleus. And the signal molecule has the ability, the physical ability to dissolve through the membrane and enter the cell. And this is normally what happens with lipid signals and some of the gases like nitric oxide. A great example of the latter is cortisol. Cortisol is a steroid hormone which has no problem passing through the plasma membrane and entering the cytosol where its receptor, a nuclear receptor protein, is waiting and once it binds it activates its receptor which can then travel into the nucleus and activate genes. This is the very first signal transduction pathway that students should remember, cortisol. Cortisol itself is a steroid and it has many cousins which exist inside cells. So testosterone is a derivative that looks very similar to cortisol. All of these molecules, believe it or not, have a father molecule called cholesterol. And it's from cholesterol that they are then built through biochemical pathways in the cells that generate these signal molecules. Since we mentioned gases acting as signals, here's the most famous gas of all, nitric oxide. So nitric oxide can enter cells and it can bind to its target protein, guanine cyclase, and that activates that enzyme 
And what that enzyme does in the cytosol is it converts GTP, a famous molecule, into a cyclic version of itself, just like cyclic AMP. And this molecule then becomes a messenger that travels within the cytosol of the cell. So we have two messengers, the red molecule, and then when these are produced, these purple molecules. Once cyclic AMP is produced, it then has a knock-on effect in various ways, depending on the type of cell in which it's produced. In this particular example, we have smooth cells. And what it does to smooth cells is it relaxes them. It causes the relaxation of that smooth cell. We know now that most of the blood vessels have a layer of smooth muscle cells surrounding them so that the lumen, the aperture of this lumen, can be regulated. So when these muscles contract, the lumen shrinks in size. So if muscle cells are relaxed in the presence of nitric oxide, then these muscles will relax and the blood pressure will cause the lumen of this blood vessel to increase in diameter. This happens all over your body to control the flow of blood into the local tissues. And the nitric oxide is produced by the lining of the blood vessels themselves, the endothelial cells. So this is a local mechanism that's been working inside our bodies for millions and millions of years. The nitric oxide is very short-lived and is easily eliminated from the circulation. If we take a moment to consider other types of muscle cells and how they are controlled, then that will help us understand the general overall context of where this chapter is taking us. Figures such as this are important points in allowing students to recall information from previous chapters. If you take a moment and convince yourself that you know how an action potential is propagated down a neuron, and then what happens in the neural terminus, and then how information is then passed across the synapse, and then how those molecules bind to the cell receptors, and then how the flow of sodium triggers the release of calcium, then you'll be in a better position to understand how signal transduction is actually implemented inside living cells. These are fantastic revision tools that students sometimes bypass. So here we have ion channels, both calcium ion channels and sodium ion channels on two different sides of the synapse. So the voltage gated calcium channels respond to a voltage on the inner surface of the exon. As that voltage propagates through the cytoplasm of the nerve cell, it causes the intake of calcium. The calcium then triggers the blending of the vesicles containing neurotransmitter to the plasma membrane of the nerve cell. How and why this happens? Please refer to the chapter on protein transport. Once the neurotransmitter is released, it then binds as a ligand to its receptors on the target cell, in our case, the muscle cell. Binding to the target cell, as indicated here, causes a conformational change in that receptor, leading to the flow of sodium down its concentration gradient. So these acetylcholine receptors are basically ion channels. And we learned about ion channels very early on in chapter the cell surface receptors fall into a number of discrete categories, as indicated on this slide. So some of them, as we just saw, act as ion channels. Others act as G-protein receptors. And the third category are enzyme-linked receptors. We're going to spend a long time in the second half of this video looking at these different classes of receptor molecules and giving you examples, at least two in each category. For now, let's look at what happens once these receptors are activated. So the binding of a ligand to the receptor causes a conformational change on the cytoplasmic face of that same receptor. It then becomes a binding site for other protein that's already hanging around in the cytosol. And once you trigger one piece of signaling pathway, then that activates another component 
further downstream, and then that activates something else. Eventually, the signal is then deposited in various changes, which depend on the type of cell in which this is happening, and where in its life cycle that cell is, i.e. which of these components are present, and at what concentration these are present in that cell type. So this is an important difference, right? So going back to the acetylcholine example that we saw earlier, where the acetylcholine is able to trigger different behavior in different cells, the reason why we get different behavior in these cells is that because they contain different chemistries and they respond appropriately. Another common terminology from physiology is the labeling of the messenger molecules. So the signal as it comes from the outside is called the primary signal or the primary messenger. Inside the cell, somewhere along this pathway, we can get other molecules that can diffuse rapidly and amplify themselves, and they are called second messengers or secondary messengers. And we'll learn about these a bit later on. The important thing here is that the cell's behavior is normally changed as a result of binding a signal to its receptor. The other important thing to realize is that in most cases, the signal becomes amplified as it cascades through the cytosol into different parts of the cell. So a small binding, a single signal binding to one receptor can in some cases have a massive impact on the biochemistry of the cell depending on the presence of alternative factors. Sometimes this journey can be quite complex with a complex interplay in the biochemistry and gene expression of the cell. If you look at it in a very systematic way, what you're seeing here is a microcomputer, a chemical microcomputer, a biochemical microcomputer, where information is received, then it's passed on to other components within the cell called a relay, then that signal can be amplified and transduced into alternative languages. Then it's integrated, depending on how else the cell is behaving. It may make one decision versus another. And then the actions are distributed to the various effector parts of the cell. This is the big picture that students should leave with chapter 16. Recall that signal pathways can have a feedback mechanism where the presence of something further downstream can come back and have an effect on something upstream. And if it increases the activity of something upstream, then that's called positive feedback. And if it decreases something upstream, then it's called negative feedback. And this can happen in combination or one way or the other. Within these pathways, within these cascades, we can have different components being turned on and off using different means. And this slide is simply reminding us that proteins can be turned on and off based on the signal that the cell receives. So some signals in this case will turn the protein on and that signal will then be continued by the activity of the activated protein. And that's what's happening in these figures here as one protein activates another, activates another. At the molecular level, this is happening all the time. In this example, ATP is used to transfer it's one of its phosphates to the protein in blue, and the protein now has an alternative shape because of the presence of the phosphate, and that activates its active site. The removal of the phosphate will turn the protein back off, and that will be performed by a different enzyme. So kinases, they add phosphate groups to proteins, and phosphatases remove phosphate groups from proteins. So this is what this slide wants you to learn. Kinases versus phosphatases. Very important concept. In an alternative situation, where proteins are again turned on and off, it's not the shape of the protein that's important, it's its partner. So here, GDP is a partner to the protein at 12 o'clock, and GTP is the partner to the protein at 6 o'clock. So by replacing the partner, you can turn the protein on and off. Please spend a few moments just comparing this diagram to this one. And notice how there's a big difference. 
We mentioned a few slides back that cell surface receptors fall into three main classes. So let's reiterate that. So class one would be the iron channel coupled receptors. So here's the receptor. These are normally transmembrane proteins and they bind to their ligands. And in this case, it just opens an iron channel. So this iron channel opens and the appropriate ions will move depending on their concentration and the membrane potential of this particular cell. The next category is a bit more sophisticated in its functionality. These are called G protein coupled receptors. There's two parts here. It talks about the receptor itself, which is in green, but the receptor has a working relationship with another set of proteins, which are also held close to the membrane, either by being embedded in the membrane or by being, a, by being attached covalently to parts of the membrane. So the simplified G protein here will interact with the receptor and then we get the full name. G protein coupled receptor. So there's the coupling going on between the G protein and the receptor on top. Once the G protein has been activated and we'll learn how that happens in a few slides, the G protein will then have some kind of effect on its, its target molecules and in this slide the target molecule is this dark brown one and it somehow interacts with it. The last types that we'll be tackling in this chapter are the enzyme coupled receptors. So once again, break down the words. So the word receptor is for any kind of protein that allows signals to be received. And here, these receptors or their partners will be involved in some kind of enzymatic activity that will then pass on the signal. Here's a great example of a simple system where the binding of a signal causes two transmembrane proteins to become dimerized, that means come together, and then they will activate each other and that will set off a sequence of events. Or an alternative way is that the signal protein completes two halves of a receptor and once the receptor halves are coming together, they will then activate a signal cascade. So both of these mechanisms work. All three mechanisms are summarized here. Please spend a few minutes just relating one to the other. Thank you. We're going to take a deeper journey into each of these classes of receptors. Let's start with one of the most difficult, the second type, the G protein coupled receptors, of which there's many, many, many examples that we know about on cells. As these two slides elude, there's a lot that we know about them we need to learn some examples of each type and see how they differ from each other to complete our repertoire of understanding. Let's begin at the very beginning. The receptor itself is a transmembrane protein. And in all cases, these transmembrane proteins, they have seven parts of their structure that pass through the membrane. Therefore, they're known as seven pass proteins or hepta helical proteins. Hepta means seven. Helical means they have seven helices. And each one of these is a helix, as you can see down here. The binding of a ligand to the extracellular surface causes a corresponding change to the cytosolic surface. And that's the trigger. In a non-activated situation, the receptor is distinct from the G protein. Now, if you look at the G protein here, and these are called large G proteins, by the way, large, because they're massive. Um, they normally have, not always, but normally have three parts. The first part is called alpha. The second part is called beta. And the third part is called gamma, alpha, beta, gamma. And the association of all three parts normally keeps the G protein in an inactive state. So the receptor is inactive and the G protein is inactive. Whereas upon the binding of a signal to the transmembrane receptor, it changes shape on the inside. You can see that little bulge that wasn't there there, but is here now. And that bulge is a receptor for a corresponding complementary shape on the actual G protein. And the binding of the receptor to the alpha subunit of the G protein causes a change 
in its configuration, where it loses its nested molecule of GDP, which flies away, and that's replaced by a more powerful and energetically charged GTP. And the GTP binding to the alpha subunit causes it to change shape drastically, pushing away its beta and gamma subunits. And that, in most cases, will activate both. Now, you can see here that the alpha subunit is tethered to the membrane, so it is restricted to this vicinity of its cytosol. And likewise, the beta and gamma subunits, normally through the gamma, are also tethered to the membrane, so they're prevented from drifting too far away. Both subunits are active, and they'll stay active as long as there's GTP sitting inside this chamber. Now, the activity of these two proteins could have a timer, and it does in most cases. So as soon as the GTP loses one of its phosphates, it'll become GDP. And that'll cause the alpha subunit to change shape back to its original shape, and then that will bind back to the beta gamma going back to this condition here. Unless the signal is still bound to the receptor, when this complex will take another visit and bind with the receptor and reactivate. So there's two signal and timing events going on here. One is the ligand binding to the receptor. If that ligand is only bound to the receptor temporarily, it will activate this system once. If it's bound there for a longer period of time, it may activate this molecule multiple times, or even activate multiple G proteins. So this is not the only one that's present in the membrane. As soon as this one's activated, another one could move in and bind to the receptor. So these are very important principles that students have to get their heads around. So far, we've just seen the beginning of the pathway. So once this is activated, and this is activated, what can happen next? What happens in the effector activation? The next slide gives us a clue as to what the next step could be in some circumstances. So here we have the alpha subunit with its GTP that in most cases will mean that it's active. And for the first time, it's able to bind to another protein that we didn't talk about on the previous slide. And that's the target protein of the alpha subunit. And the two will associate, and that will activate the target protein, and the target protein will then do something else. And that can vary from cell type to cell type. Once the activity of the target protein has been initiated, a change in the GTP to GDP will cause it to be deactivated. So the brown protein is only active for a fraction of a second or so, as long as the GTP is bound to the alpha subunit. Once that GDP is hydrolyzed, um, once, did, sorry, once the GTP is hydrolyzed to GDP, then the brown protein is no longer active because it's no longer able to bind to the alpha subunit. And then the alpha subunit will find and reassociate to form the unactivated or the inactive G protein. If you wish to learn this material, which you must for the exam, then I would spend a few minutes just understanding how this system here works. Combine this with what started the whole process here, and you'll get to the understanding of how signal transduction pathways begin. Obviously, things can go wrong in any part of these signal transduction pathways. And interestingly, in our textbooks, they do mention two very common diseases that are prevalent in the population. One is cholera, found in many developing countries and sometimes in the United States, where the toxin itself, it locks the alpha subunit in this state. So it prevents it from going to this state. And we call that GS for the activated state. And in the case of pertussis, whooping cough, that toxin inactivates the G protein alpha subunit and locks it in the GDP state, this state here. Here's your next compound understanding slide. In this case, 
we're going to use a G protein coupled receptor, this one here, to cause an effect inside this cell. So we're going to follow the entire pathway. The pathway is quite simple. The activation of the protein receptor will activate the G protein, which will then turn on this ion channel. So ion channels can be turned on not by simply binding ligands themselves, but through this signal transduction pathway. And that's what's going on in this slide. This actual example pertains to heart muscle cells, not the pacemaker cells, but the heart muscle cells themselves. So acetylcholine can bind to the receptor on the surface of those cells. And what it does, it activates the alpha and the beta subunits and the gamma subunit. It's the beta and the gamma subunit which then binds to the potassium ion channels and allows potassium to move down its gradient. And in the case of potassium, as you know, it's high on the inside and low on the outside, and that potassium will leave into the extracellular environment. And that will continue as long as the alpha subunit is bound to its GTP. As soon as it hydrolyzes its GTP, as indicated here, it will then call back its partners and they will leave the ion channel and at that point the ion channel will close. In alternative systems that we've discovered in other cells, something different happens. Here we see that the activity of the beta and the gamma subunit results in the conversion of some chemistry within the cytosol of the cell. So here it's not opening an ion channel, it's converting these squares into circles. Now these circles are normally going to be produced in such large quantities that they'll diffuse to many regions deep inside the cytosol and even into the nucleus. And because these molecules are generated in such large waves, they're known as second messengers. Not only do secondary messengers amplify the signal, but they transmit it rapidly to many other far-reaching places inside the cell. Students need to remember that there are three important second messengers that we're going to talk about in the subsequent slides. The first one is cyclic AMP, and we'll talk about that next. There's another one, inositol trisphosphate, abbreviated to IP3, that we'll talk about after we talk about cyclic AMP. And while we're talking about that, we'll also talk about DAG, diacylglycerol. So these are the three second messengers that we need to learn about in the remaining slides. In particular, we need to know how they're made, what makes them, and what do they do. Once you understand that, you're well on your way to understanding how signal transduction works within cells. Here's a tiny bit of biochemistry that you must remember. You're familiar with this molecule, believe it or not, because this is ATP. It's the energy currency of the cell. This is your rechargeable battery in its fully charged version. And these bonds here between the phosphates and the oxygens, when broken, they release a lot of energy. However, as nature is beautiful, it can take a molecule like this and subvert its function for something else. And that's exactly what happens if this enzyme here, and this is the main enzyme, adenyl cyclase, if this enzyme is activated, then the phosphate bond is broken here straight away, and this oxygen is connected to this carbon down here. And you end up with this cyclic structure. Therefore, this entire molecule containing adenine and ribose is called AMP. But it's not just AMP, it's cyclic AMP. And this is a secondary messenger. The cyclic AMP, once it's not needed any further, instead of going back to form ATP, it's simply hydrolyzed by another enzyme called cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase. And, and what that does, it just breaks the bond 
resulting in AMP, which is then recycled by the cell. Once cyclic AMP is produced inside its target cell, it can have a number of different outcomes depending on which cell it's acting in. So if the target tissue is the heart, it's going to increase the heart rate and also the force with which the muscles of the heart, the cardiac muscles, contract. If the same substance is produced in skeletal muscle, it's going to cause the skeletal muscle to start breaking down glycogen for use as an energy molecule. In fat cells, it's going to start breaking down fat. And in the adrenal glands, the result is the secretion of cortisol into the environment. Let's build our learning by seeing how skeletal muscle breaks down glycogen in the presence of adrenaline. The next slide shows you the pathway taken to achieve that at a very simplified level. So this is a skeletal muscle. Here's the signal molecule, the primary messenger. Once it binds to its receptor, the receptor is activated. That turns on the alpha subunit of the G protein, the stimulatory subunit. That binds to an enzyme that's also held against the membrane of skeletal muscles. That enzyme is the adenylocyclase. And what it does, it picks up the vast amounts of ATP that are hanging around all over the cytosol, and it starts converting it to cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP quickly diffuses and binds to a protein called PKA. The binding of cyclic AMP to PKA activates PKA. So this is the missing part that PKA needs. It's complement. And once it binds, PKA changes shape and becomes activated. What does it act on? It acts on this phosphorylase kinase. This is an enzyme that will add phosphates to something else. And you can see once it's activated by being phosphorylated itself, that's what PKA does. It adds phosphates uh, to this molecule. It changes shape and it becomes activated itself. Once it's active, <laughs> it then activates another enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase. And the glycogen phosphorylase becomes phosphorylated itself. And once it's activated, it will then turn on the pathway leading to the breakdown of glycogen. So look very carefully. We have a number of proteins have a knock-on effect on each other. But this is how the cell works. At the beginning of this pathway, we learned about a few slides back. So the only new thing is the blue, the light green, and the dark green, and its outcome. So it's not too much to ask students to remember this pathway, where PKA is activated by cyclic AMP. That then activates phosphorylase kinase, which then activates glycogen phosphorylase, resulting in like I said earlier, glycogen breakdown. So please take a few moments to learn that. In another cell, the beginning of the pathway may end up doing something different because some of the other enzymes are missing. For instance, if phosphorylase kinase is not present, then the pathway could be altered in another way so that something different happens. So the beginning is the same here. If you look very carefully, the beginning is the same. So once cyclic AMP is produced, it still binds with PKA and activates PKA. But this time the PKA migrates into the nucleus through nuclear pores, and there it activates a transcription factor, a protein that regulates transcription by phosphorylating it. And the phosphorylated transcription factor can then bind to the enhancer or the promoter of its target gene or genes, then transcription will ensue and it will produce some kind of product, either RNA, but most probably a protein that will have some function within that cell. A deeper piece of understanding that you must now build up is if you focus on the light blue molecules here, the PKAs, they have been characterized. We've studied them, we've isolated their proteins, we know what they do. They are known as kinases. 
Indeed, when you add phosphates to something else, you are a kinase. Now, the place at which they add phosphates to the green molecule is at the green molecules serines or threonines. These are amino acids on the surface of the green molecule. So the active pKa will take from ATP, its phosphate, and then shuttle that on to these two positions on the surface of the green molecule. You need to know this difference as well. So pKa has two functions. One is to activate enzymes, and the other in certain other cells is to activate genes. Let's turn our attention to a related and but different system, and that uses inositol phospholipids. So these are alternative classes of phospholipids that are part of the inner leaflet of many cells in the body. And you can see the lipid bilayer here, the cytosolic leaflet, and attached to it through its fatty acids are these molecules. So it may shock some students to realize that lipids can play a part in signal transduction, especially lipids that are part of the lipid bilayer. The phospholipid can be broken down in the presence of an appropriate enzyme, phospholipase C, into two constituents. What the phospholipase C does, it breaks the bond right there, therefore releasing this half of the molecule from this half of the molecule. This half of the molecule stays connected to the membrane, but its name changes to DAG, and we'll talk about DAG in a minute. The other half of the molecule is then now free to migrate deep into the cytosol and even into the far reaches of the cell once it's released. And that's called IP3. And the reason it's called IP3 is because they are three phosphates on that ring of sugar, whereas there were just two phosphates when the molecule was still attached to its other half. So this is called PIP2, and this is called IP3, and this is called DAG. So keep an eye on those three names as we move forward. Here we go. So you may be shocked about the detail on this slide, but believe it or not, there's only one area of new information. Everything else is the same as you've already witnessed, either in this video or a previous video. Let's talk about the previous video. We learned in the past that calcium is stored inside the endoplasmic reticulum, and the levels of calcium in the cytosol are kept on purpose very low, and that difference in the concentration of calcium can be used to the advantage of the cell. So here is that example of where calcium can be used to the advantage of the cell. The calcium can only enter the cytosol if this calcium ion channel is opened. And this calcium ion channel will only be opened by its ligand. And its ligand is going to be this molecule here, our IP3. So keep an eye on that. So once the calcium enters the cytosol, it will then have a major effect on a lot of biochemistry of this cell. And we'll come back and talk about that in a second. So where does this ligand come from, this IP3? Well, the IP3 was initially was a member of the inositol phospholipid, as we saw on the previous slide here. So by the action of phospholipase C, this IP3 will be liberated. But what turns on the phospholipase C? And here's the phospholipase C. Well, the phospholipase C is turned on by a G protein. The G protein's beta and gamma subunit turn on phospholipase C. Why does that happen? Because the receptor molecule, the receptor for this cell, has bound to a signal. And the binding of that signal causes this activity to take place. Once the inositol phospholipid has been broken up into two parts, both parts play a role in activating the activity of this cell. The DAG, DAG, diacylglycerol, is an important constituent when it comes to binding to a target protein. So this brown protein here needs two 
partners. It needs the DAG and it needs the calcium before it become activated. What is that protein? It's called PKC, PKC, properly known as protein kinase C. It too is a serine threonine kinase. That means it will hunt down its target proteins and attach to them phosphates on their serines and their threonines. It's going to be different to PKA that we spoke about on another slide recently. In the example that we just looked at, the activation of phospholipase C by the G protein resulted in something. Well, it depends. In a liver cell, the primary messenger is a hormone called vasopressin. When it binds to its G protein receptor, GPCR, it results in the activation of phospholipase C that produces an end result of glycogen breakdown. In the pancreas, you get the release of a digestive enzyme. In smooth muscle, you get contraction. And in blood platelets, you get aggregation. So different effects in different tissues. The release of calcium has profound implications for cells. So this difference in calcium between the endoplasmic reticulum and the cytosol and how that calcium is released has been utilized in many different ways by biological organisms. For instance, we know that when a sperm fertilizes an egg to become a zygote, the point of entry of the sperm head triggers a release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum and from the environment in which the cell is sitting into the cytosol. And you can see that calcium entering the cytosol as a giant wave that changes the characteristic of the egg, preventing further sperm from penetrating and fertilizing. The protein calmodulin, which is very important inside cells, is unable to do its job unless it's bound to calcium. And it binds to four ions of calcium. And when it does so, it can then bend and wrap itself around target proteins, therefore binding and increasing the shape or binding and cutting. One of the superior outcomes of using these GPCRs, these G protein coupled receptors, is at the location of the retina. In the retina, we have rod cells and cone cells which are able to transduce light into electrical activity in neurons. So this is the ultimate in signal transduction. Here, as you can see, we have a G protein called transducin. That's the name of the G protein. It exists as a alpha, beta, and gamma subunit. And when its receptor, the rhodopsin molecule, binds to photons of light rather than a chemical ligand, it changes shape. That causes the transducin to change shape, which then triggers an enzyme called cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase to be activated, and so on. Uh, you're not required to learn this pathway, except maybe the name of the G protein transducin. So when it comes to photoreceptors, just remember transducin and that it interacts with cyclic GMP. Now that we have reached a climax with GPCRs, let's move on to the last section. Let's look at enzyme-coupled receptors. So these are receptors that are not connected to large G proteins. The receptors are either themselves enzymes or they are connected to enzymes. Here's a summary of where the next 10 to 15 slides will take us. So first we'll look at enzyme-linked receptors. Then we'll look at how they pass on their signals downstream and some of the mechanisms. Then we'll look at fast track signaling. And then we'll look at signal networks. And that'll take us to the end of the chapter. This slide conveys the general principle in which the signal is first perceived and how the system is initiated. The arrival of the primary messenger at the cell surface causes different proteins to be brought together, forming a dimer and sometimes a trimer 
the close proximity of these two proteins for a change causes one to activate the other. And this is where the enzymatic activity takes place. Because these proteins are kinases, they will place phosphates on their partners. So within a very short period of time, you may end up, for example, looking like this. Here we have four phosphates added to the dimer on each side. So a total of eight phosphates. Because the phosphates on the surface of the protein changes their shape, now for the first time, other proteins, which were wandering around inside the cytosol, are able to dock onto the surface of the receptors. So these tyrosine kinase domains become very important in building up a structure which then activates these other proteins to bring in other functionality. And this cascade then continues to turn on the behavior of the cell. The key words are dimerization, kinase activity, and then signal propagation. One such pathway that's pretty common inside cells is indicated on this and the subsequent slide. I was very careful to mention large G proteins when talking about GPCRs, because in this case, we're going to be talking about small G proteins. So, so um, small G proteins are simply small compared to the large G proteins. They're basically the alpha subunit working alone. And we'll see that in these slides in this section. So let's start at the beginning. The first part is obvious from the slide we just looked at. The presence of the signal causes dimerization that permits the kinase activity to apply phosphates onto their partner molecules. Once the partner molecules have changed their shape because of the presence of the phosphates, they can bind other proteins, and those proteins are known as adapter proteins. In this particular example, that binding makes possible the binding of the RAS GEF protein, which is activated. And once this protein is activated, it has the ability to interact with the target protein. And this is the name that we are going to look at right now. This protein here is called RAS, R-A-S, and it has a GDP partner in this normal inactive form. The protein is kept tethered to the membrane by covalent bonding with the phospholipids. RAS protein is very important. RAS protein can be turned into an activated form simply by swapping out its GDP for a GTP. That change cannot take place intrinsically within the green protein that has to be promoted by the RAS GEF. Once that happens, the RAS protein is activated and then it can have various target molecules that it turns on subsequently, as we'll see on the next slide. So one pathway that's very common and the first to be discovered was where the RAS protein activates this protein here. It's called a MAP protein, but it's not called just MAP, it's called MAP kinase kinase kinase. It happened to be the third one discovered. But this protein phosphorylates its target protein, which is called the MAP kinase kinase. Once that's turned on, it phosphorylates its target called MAP kinase, which then phosphorylates a bunch of other proteins that can lead to drastic changes in the behavior of cells from protein activity to and including gene expression. This is one behavior of activated RAS protein inside cells. I think we are now ready to see one of the most sophisticated interactions that explains how survival signals work. So in this example here, we have a survival signal, which is the primary messenger. It binds to its receptors. It turns on those receptors by cross-phosphorylation which get phosphorylated. Once they're phosphorylated, their target protein, 
PI3 kinase comes in, and this protein is an enzyme that can convert inositol phospholipids into IP3 by the simple addition of another phosphate. So this is IP2 and this is IP3. So we're familiar with IP3 from a previous discussion on G proteins, G protein coupled receptors. Once IP3 is generated for the first time, its shape is now compatible with protein kinase 1, the brown protein. Once that binds, it gets activated. Since it's a kinase, it looks for its target in the vicinity. Normally that target is wandering deep inside the cytosol of the cell. However, AKT, the green molecule, also binds to other molecules of IP3. So IP3 is key in bringing these two molecules together and activating protein kinase 1. Once that happens, then phosphates are added to AKT by a complicated pathway, but ultimately the activity of AKT is increased. What does AKT do? It has a profound effect on something called BAD that exists inside the cell. BAD is a protein. BAD binds to BCL2. And BCL2 is the survival protein, which we'll learn in another chapter. Regardless, we must release BCL2 so that it can save the cell from self-destruction, apoptosis. So AKT has a role in cell survival. So the survival signal that was received by the surface of the cell has now been conveyed through this process to AKT. AKT is a kinase, and one of its main targets is the protein BAD. Once BAD has been phosphorylated by AKT, it can no longer continue to bind to BCL2. Releasing BCL2 changes its shape, and BCL2 then can promote cell survival. Should any part of this pathway become defective or blocked, then the consequences for the cell are dire, as it will then be unable to save itself and therefore prevent the suicide pathway from being activated. Very simple scientific experiments were conducted to deduce which parts of the receptor is responsible for binding to which part of the cascade. So in this case, we have three regions, Y1, Y2, and Y3. And through experimentation, if the amino acid sequence of the receptor at Y2 was changed to alanine, for instance, then it would prevent the binding of the pink protein to those locations. And then you could see what effect the pink proteins would have on signal transduction. Likewise, mutating the third site, Y3, would allow the cell to bind the blue and the pink proteins, but not the dark blue proteins. And then you can deduce the function of that interference. Our understanding of this signal transduction pathway involving these enzymes is reaching a new chapter. Cancer cells, as we'll learn in chapter 20, can disentangle these pathways for their own benefit. By primary research and studying cancer cells, we have a two-pronged attack on deducing the complexity with which cells have evolved an interplay of biochemical pathways. So the analogy to a giant city is appropriate. Just like in a giant city, you have lots of roadways. And if one roadway has an accident or roadworks, you can get to work by taking an alternative pathway, but it may have consequences on how long it takes to get to work and therefore changes your relationship with your employer, for instance, if you're late. The same thing appears to be working inside cells. Many pathways intersect each other in many different ways. Some elements are repetitive, 
Some elements are used multiple times. Sometimes the concentration of one component varies, and that can impact how one pathway interacts with another pathway. So the take-home message from this is that a single cell, which may have up to 10,000 different types of receptors, both on the surface and in the cytosol, how that cell responds is a very compound outcome. From one second to another, the combination of signals and their interplay in the cytosol will decide the outcome. That is the ultimate take-home at this time.